what is processed food? What is all this stuff that, that we're eating? Um, and I started wondering about that when I started covering food um, about 10 years ago. And I was covering it as a, as a business journalist. I had written about business for, for a number of years. And I started looking at all this food differently. And I just wondered what was behind it. And I, and I started going, I started talking to people in the industry. I started talking to food scientists. Um, I didn't really know what food scientists did or that there was even a career called food scientist. But it's a very um, uh, elaborate and complicated and, and thriving um, career. And I started going to these trade shows, which were, um, they just, they just kind of, they blew me away. They were, they were fascinating window into what the world of food had become. And there was this one called the Institute of Food Technologists. And this is one of the food industry's largest gatherings. There's about 1,500 companies that exhibit at, the, at this thing. And most of them are ingredient companies. So they're making all these things that, these weird ingredients that go into processed food. And as I walked around um, and talked to people, talked to people at these different companies, they all told me these, these, um, these stories about, about their food. And a lot of them had created these prototype foods um, with their ingredients in them. So, I, so you know, I went around and I, um, I went to this one booth where um, these, these people were selling these fake um, uh, fruit bits, fake, fake blueberry bits. And they had made these muffins that had fake blueberries in them that were made with sugar, flour, cornstarch, and just really a dash of pulverized blueberries, but enough so that um, food manufacturers could use them to, um, say, made with real blueberries and, and try and convince people that they were actually using blueberries in their product, such as this one. Um, and um, if, I hadn't, if, if the guy hadn't told me, I, t I ate one of the blueberry muffins, and if the guy hadn't told me, I would have thought that they were real blueberries. It was extremely convincing. But the amazing thing about this was that the guy was, complete, was so proud of this that his product simulated blueberries and it was a very effective way for food manufacturers to cut down on cost and not have to use real food, in this case, blueberries. Um, I went to another, another booth where a guy was talking about his, uh, his specially modified starches and other types of um, ingredients that could cut down on the amount of meat that, food, that um, fast food makers could use. And at the time, their... Um, their starches and um, some of their products were being used at, at, at Taco Bell. And one of their, and they were, it was on the um, ingredient list as isolated oat product. And this became something that people started uh, wondering about when Taco Bell, do you remember of, probably about six years ago now that Taco Bell was sued for um, not having much meat in their, um, in their tacos? The lawsuit didn't go anywhere, but... Um, but people started looking at Taco Bell's ingredients, and, I, and there was at one point when the, the CEO of Taco Bell was on Good Morning America with George Stephanopoulos, and he, he asked, he said, I have to ask you, what is isolated oat product? Like, why is that in a taco? And, um, and it was amazing because the CEO had absolutely no idea. He, even the CEO didn't know what was in the food and, um, and why it was in there. And he just said something, well, everything's in there for a specific reason, and it's all flavorings. But in the case of isolated oat product, it's actually not flavorings. It's so that they can use less meat. Um, it's, a, it's a binder and a filler. Um, and then I went, you know, I went around and, and, and talked to other people and ate more food. And um, I felt awful afterwards, by the way. At the end of the day, I ate all this horrible food, um, which a lot of it tasted good at the time, though. You don't really notice that it's horrible until after. Um, I had samples of uh, beef barbacoa, which this was a, a, f um, a flavor company that, was, that had made this. And this beef barbacoa was neither beef nor barbacoa. It was not slow roasted with spices. Uh, it had been quickly cooked um, and then frozen and reheated. And it was chicken, it wasn't beef. So it had been made to taste like chicken with um, an extremely convincing natural um, beef type flavoring. And it was made from hydrolyzed yeast extract and MSG. Um, and it was extremely convincing as, as well. I would have thought that it was you know, actual beef barbacoa. Certainly that it was beef and not chicken. Um, I talked to other 
companies about their fake Greek yogurt. Uh, there was a company that was selling starches where you could, instead of make, this is at the time that Greek yogurt was taking the country by storm, and instead of actually buying these expensive straining machines to make Greek yogurt, um, you could just add in um, starches to thicken the product and um, these cheap um, protein concentrates, milk protein concentrate to give it the extra protein that, that Greek yogurt has. And I looked at the guy and, who was telling me about all this, and, and I thought, and I said, well, you know, people are buying Greek yogurt because they think it's a cert certain type of thing, and aren't you just duping consumers? Um, and he looked at me and he said, well, you know, which kind, which kind of his, his face told me, okay, yes, but, and he said, but the FDA has no standards for what is Greek yogurt. Basically saying that um, as long as they could get away with it, they would. The FDA, there's, there's no, um, nobody really knows what Greek yogurt is. You can't say what Greek yogurt is, so this is, this is absolutely fine. And for a while, the, there was, it was in stores. YoPlay was, was using this um, technology, I guess you could call it, to, um, to make fake Greek yogurt, and some of the store brands were. But the good news is now they've all um, stopped doing that, and they actually do the proper um, straining of, of, Greek, of Greek yogurt. Um, and it wasn't until I, um, I tasted a, um, oh, I have, wait, I have another side. Yeah, this was, oh, this was a guy that told me that, I asked what his company did, and he said, we build milk backwards. And it, <laughs> it took me a while to, uh, to actually figure out what he was talking about. And this is a very simplified version of what he was talking about. It's all these um, processed um, products that you can get from from milk, and, and all those are different ingredients that get added into processed food for a variety of reasons. The milk protein concentrate is the one that goes, in, and whey protein concentrate goes into Kraft Singles and, um, and into the fake Greek yogurts. Um, but it wasn't until I, I tasted this, um, this parfait type product with like a single strawberry on top that I really started to feel like Alice in, in Wonderland. Because I didn't know, I tasted it, and it was kind of vanilla-ish, but I didn't know, I was like, is it pudding? Is it, wh what, is the, what is this product? And I went up to the people behind the booth, and it was, it was a starch company that was, that was selling it, one of the really big ingredient companies, and they were featuring one of their modified starches and um, crystalline fructose as a, as a sweetener. So I knew that that was in it, but I was like, what, what is the actual food in it? Like, what, what is this, what do we call this? And she just, that was the, perhaps the, the strangest question she had had all day because she just stared at me. She had absolutely no idea what this product was or what, what was in it. And she looked at her colleague and, and she, they both just shrugged their shoulders. And so finally she said, well, it's a, um, it's a cultured dairy product. Oh, and I said, oh, okay, well, so it's yogurt. No, no, it's not yogurt. It's a, it's a pulverized ingredient. It's, um, it's some kind of... Um, fermented or cultured um, dairy product that's that's been powdered and you you add water to it and I suddenly realized that that was what that was what was happening throughout this convention and in the food industry at large all of the so many of the ingredients that are going into processed food are just that they're powders and they come from four main commodity crops cheaply produced commodity crops um, Wheat, soybeans, corn, and um, milk. And these are used to create all different kinds of products. The biggest ones are obviously high fructose corn syrup, um, soybean oil, corn oil, um, all the powders that you get, that you get from milk, um, and refined grains um, and flours from, from wheat. And if you, actually, if you look at a lot of products um, at fast food restaurants or in the grocery store, You'll see that if you look at look at the individual ingredients, you realize that a majority of them are coming that are exactly that these powders that are coming from these four um, commodity crops. So, um, and, and what the food industry is doing, as I walked, as I started talking to more and more people in the industry, I noticed, I, I started noticing that a lot of people would would say use the word application. Like they'd say, well, this is something for a meat application or a cheese application. 
And I thought, an application? What, aren't we talking about food? You know, and that's, some, that's a term that people in Silicon Valley use. I, I lived in Silicon Valley for a while writing about um, the technology industry. And an app is short for application. It's a software program. So essentially what the food industry is doing and what food scientists are doing is engineering these individual ingredients, these processed ingredients, um, into things that they're selling as food. Um, but to me, that they're not food. That's not food. And I started to, when I would go to these conferences, and especially the first time, I went to them several times, I kind of started to feel like I was crazy because everyone else seemed to think that this was totally normal. There was no shame in doing this and using these powdered ingredients to replace real food in products in order to make food cheaper and, and, more, um, and easier and more efficient for the food manufacturers. Um, this was the way that this was the way business was done, and it, ha and it wasn't particularly new. It had been, been this way for some time. And here I was, I mean, I kind of felt like a stranger in a strange land because at least at the time, there, there weren't many um, journalists or, or outsiders that would go to these conferences. I mean, why, why would you? Um, it was people that worked in the food industry or trade journalists that would write about this, and they were just so, so used to it. And, um, and here I was coming in with this very um, outdated and traditional notion that food was something that had to have come from a farm and had to have a connection to a farm and had to resemble something um, that came from a farm. Um, but that wasn't the way um, the people in the food industry thought about it at all. Um, at least not, you know, publicly when they're, when they're talking about it. They might have private moments where they th think something differently. Um, so, you know, to me, food is something that, that must have a connection to, to the earth. It's something that, that's where the source of, food is something that has to be nourishing. I mean, we, we can't survive without the nourishment that comes from, from food. And the, the um, you know, the problem in the, in the food industry is that the, the more you process something, uh, the, the, less the, le the more you take away that connection to the sunlight, the soil, um, the earth, uh, that it comes from and, is, and that is the source of all the nourishment of our, of our food. So, um, you know, people in the, in the food industry will, um, will dispute this, right? They'll say, uh, maybe some of you heard them say, uh, if, you know, I've certainly had many conversations with people. Well, they'll say, um, you know, pr food processing isn't, isn't new. It's been around for millennia since cavemen were cooking over a fire. Um, and, and they'll point to things like, well, all food is processed, and they'll say, and here's a, here's a slide I took from um, someone who's a, a food science professor at the University of um, Massachusetts at Amherst, where he, his slide is basically saying, well, what isn't a processed food, right? Everything's a processed food. I mean, what's, what's the problem? And he's, he's using the example of apples and lettuce and potatoes. But, you know, it's all very misleading because those are nobody's definition of processed food. An apple, potatoes, and lettuce. That is not processed food. Those are minimally processed foods, uh, of which it's a whole category, and these are things that, I mean, yes, uh, most food has been processed in some sense, but these are things that have retained their um, nutritional value. They have, they have not been completely disfigured by food scientists. They have a direct connection um, to the farm and to, to um, how they were grown. So, um, and then they'll say, they'll say things like, well, what we do inside our factories is just a larger scale version of what you do at home. Um, and that is also not, uh, not the case. Um, there, uh, what happens inside the processed food industry uh, is very different than, than what goes on at home. It's the result of all kinds of really intensely high heat processing, um, chemical um, hydrogenation, hydrolyzation, bleaching. And this is one of my favorite um, food processing machines. It's a, an extruder, a twin screw extruder. And you can see where it's an incredibly efficient machine. You put all, you see the barrel on the top, it's where you put basically everything you're, that's going to go into this, this product goes into the barrel um, and then it gets churned up inside or into the bin rather and then the the barrel it goes through the barrel and it gets churned up by these screws these really intense screws under incredibly high pressure that creates heat 
And it, it's not like a blender that you would use at home, even like a really souped up high-tech blender. It molecularly melds food together. So it takes protein molecules or starch molecules and what's called denatures them and basically rips them apart and blends them together um, in a way that they can never, never um, go back to their original state. And then at the end of the process, um, the food, and it's, extruders are used to make um, some cereals, um, a lot of bars, snack foods like Cheetos and cheese puffs, and everything comes out, it sort of puffs out at the end, and you can have any kind of shape you want at the end, the food just extrudes out of the, uh, the other side of the barrel. Um, so who has a food extruder at home in their kitchen, right? Like who has that? Or a gun puffing machine, or a 150 horsepower spray drying machine. Um, I, certain, I certainly don't. 